learn stuff. Yeah. Hey, it's Greg with Greg in the Box, and I'm here with Jasper the Parrot, and it's time to learn stuff. Pew, 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 pew. There's nothing more frustrating than having a great high quality image, but discovering that it's the wrong size, shape, or file format for your online needs. In these tutorial videos, I'm going to show you how to take those great images, pop them in the Photoshop, and then prepare and change them to meet the recommended design specifications of websites and social media. We're going to learn about file formats like RAW, JPEG, and PNG. We're going to learn about Photoshop, and we're going to learn how to use Photoshop to change those images to prepare them for the web and social media. So there's three videos, they're 10 minutes each, that's 30 minutes in total, and by the end, you will have learned stuff. And if you love these videos, please press like, leave me any questions or comments, and remember to subscribe to Greg in the Box. All right, here we are in Photoshop. Let's open up an image, File Menu, Open, and let's have a look at these two images right here. I've got a JPEG and a CR2, a .CR2, which is a RAW image taken with a Canon, so Canon RAW. JPEG, I think you're all familiar with that. Um, JPEGs are a very common file format for the web and for sending to people to view. Uh, electronically speaking, they're one of the more common file formats on the web. But what are RAW files? Well, in my camera, I've got the camera set to take two versions of each photo that I take. One in the RAW version and another copy of it saved as a JPEG. Whenever you're going uh, to use Photoshop to alter or edit or change a photo in some way, you want to consider using RAW. It's a larger file where the JPEG is a smaller file, so you won't have as much space in your camera's media or storage to store as many photos. But the data, the size of the raw image is big because it has all of the data from the sensor. The sensor inside the camera, every bit of data, of information that it uh, saw and took when you took the photo is stored in this file. So this is the full quality image that the camera could possibly take, whereas the JPEG has already been compressed and some data has been thrown out and it's been altered and squished with the intention of making the file as small as possible while still having a relatively decent look to it. The raw image contains a lot of great information. You can see when you take a raw image, you can see the original ISO setting, the f-stop, the exposure. These are the settings that were used specific to this photo. You can even see the model of the camera that took it. So that's useful information. But the most useful thing about raw images is that there's so much raw data from the sensor that when you open this up in Photoshop, you can make a lot of high quality adjustments to the look of the image. You can make it look like it was exposed better. You can alter the white balance or the colors and you can enhance many other options that are available to you. You could do something like that with a JPEG but not to the same quality and caliber. So anytime you're going to work in Photoshop with an image and you want to really get a good result and you plan to edit it in Photoshop, take a raw image as well as a JPEG. And for our purposes we're going to work with the raw. Keep in mind that most of the video that I'm going to um, run through here, you could still do most of it with a JPEG, so no worries. But if you can take a raw image and do this with me, let's go for it. So choose this raw image and say open. Okay, so whenever you open up a raw image in Photoshop, you're going to get this importing window that pops up, which gives you an opportunity to make changes to the photo before you start to work in it in Photoshop. And this is when you really get an opportunity to access the raw data from the sensor in your camera and change it, um, almost as if you could fix a mistake you made when you were taking the photo. So it's very powerful. Now I'm going to just press default here and put this back to the default settings that you'll probably see, all zeros down the middle. Now first of all, you'll see that there's a temperature here, which will be able to adjust this uh, color-wise. It's what uh, you would call white balance adjustment. And sometimes when you set your camera you may not have the white balance set correctly or the lighting may be a strange or unusual environment and you can make that tweak accordingly. Now you can always trust your eyes here but be aware that different monitors have a different look so it's hard to know exactly um, what 
uh, adjustments you need to make if you don't have a quality and professional monitor. The tint allows you to really alter it in an obvious way here. We'll keep that at zero or at 16, which is the default in this case. The exposure is exactly what you would think it would be. You can adjust it as if you had overexposed or underexposed the photo in the camera when you took it. I'm just going to do a little boost, but not too much because I don't think the exposure was too bad. You can expand or reduce the extremeness of the contrast, make the darks even darker and the brighters brighter, brighter the brightness brighter, or you can make the brightness and uh, darkness just a little bit closer to each other. So it's a it's a very gray look. Um, the default isn't bad, zero, but I'm going to just do a little bit increase the plus nine in this case. Highlights and shadows, whites and blacks. You could try all those and see what they do. Um, I will show you that the increase in the shadow I find in this case does do something kind of nice for me. It brings out the detail of uh, the dog's fur because uh, it's, a, it's a black dog. It's hard to see the details in a photograph sometimes of a black dog. So a little increase in the shadows can bring out uh, some details of the fur. And down bottom, we'll jump down to clarity and vibrance and saturation. We're going to increase the vibrance a little bit and a little bit of saturation just to bring out some of the colors that were missing because of the nature of the place we were at. There was a lot of snow and uh, it was a, a fairly colorless moment here. But this can bring in a little bit of that color in. You can see some additional green and some of the burny uh, gray uh, sort of browns that are down in the grass coming out a little bit more. So this looks good. These are some of the adjustments that you really can do effectively when you have a raw image. I'm kind of happy with that. So we're going to open it. Don't say cancel. Say open image. And here's our photo open in Photoshop. And let's have a look at the actual image information, see how big it is. To do this, we're going to go to the image menu and click on image size. You can zoom out here a little bit if you want, but this is showing you the finer detail of the quality of the image, which is important. You can see that the original image in pixels right from the camera is 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. Now that's a huge image for electronic purposes. Um, a lot of banners for our website could be 800 to by 200 pixels high. That's the kind of range you might have for a banner image for a web page. So you can see that this is pretty high up there and it's a lot of data you don't need. The resolution is 300 dots per inch, which is more or less a resolution for print quality and it's very high. We'll talk about the resolution uh, for electronic purposes later on in the video. Now we could make a change here. You can see that you could type in 1000 pixels and simply say OK and zoom in and see that at a relatively normal size that still looks great. You zoom in, you'll see that you'll quickly see pixelization a lot sooner because we cut our quality in uh, to one sixth of the original size. But if this is the size that it's meant to be looked at on your website or in your Facebook um, banner or what have you, then that looks great. All right, let's undo that. We're going to control Z on that. I'm going to zoom back out. We're going to do it a different way. But before we do that, let's look at a few more options under the image menu. Under the image menu, you've also got canvas size. Some people confuse this. Canvas size is the actual working area of the image. When would you change the canvas size? If you change the canvas size, you'll actually get more working area in Photoshop. So if I say I want the height to also be 6,000, you'll see that I got some additional working space on top. And you could do this if, for example, you wanted to make this image with a sort of a decoration on the bottom, a banner with information on it. Uh, if you wanted to alter it in some way or bring in some other element, make a collage, whatever you're doing, uh, you could add additional canvas space. It doesn't change the image, it changes the canvas space. All right, let's undo that. Control Z. And you do have image rotation, which allows you to rotate an image if you need to do that for any reason. I should also mention just in passing that under adjustments, you have a lot of the similar adjustments that you might have seen uh, when you imported the raw image. But if you're working with a JPEG, you can still use Photoshop to make changes to certain things like exposure and vibrance, white balance, color balance, all that kind of stuff. These options are available under adjustments, 
but you're not going to be able to access the raw data the same way you could if you had a raw image. Okay, let's stop there, and in part two, I'll talk about the crop tool and how I think it's the most effective way to quickly and easily change an image's aspect ratio and size to prepare it for whatever use you need it for. Learn stuff. Yeah.